to tell you what I think, that I think we ought to do this or not do that. I'm not going to give a direct answer to the question what we ought to do. Though what I will say is going to have an indirect bearing on what we ought to do. What I want to look into now is the question what it comes to for it to be true that we ought to do this or that. Maybe you ought to telephone your mother tonight. What would it come to for it to be the case that you ought to do that? Judgments to the effect that a person ought to do a thing are commonly called normative. Intuitively, the normative judgments fall into two kinds. What I've done on the handout is to list the two kinds and give some examples. Um, uh, I've written a fairly detailed uh, handout uh, because I like everybody to be with me. So uh, I hope you'll be uh, patient with it and we'll follow. It's, like, it's an outline on two sides of, uh, of the one page of uh, the main suggestions I'm going to want to make. So intuitively, they fall into two kinds. Uh, first, the judgments in the making of which we ascribe value or disvalue to a thing. These include judgments to the effect that a certain state of affairs would be good or bad for Jones or for England. Judgments to the effect that a certain experience is a good or bad experience, and so on. I'll call those judgments evaluatives. Second, there are judgments in the making of which we judge that something or a certain person ought or ought not do a thing. We've also got should and must. I'm going to fix on ought in particular. As for example, the judgment that you ought to telephone your mother tonight. I'm going to call these judgments directives, and they're the ones that I'm going to be mainly interested in. Now, intuitively, the two kinds of normative judgment interconnect. What's good or bad on the one hand must surely link in some way with what ought or ought not be done on the other hand. But how do they link? The most familiar answer that we have in the literature is a theory that's uh, nowadays called consequentialism, according to which the directives are analyzable into evaluatives in the following way. A consequentialist says that for it to be the case that a person ought to do a thing at a certain time, is for it to be the case that is doing it at that time would issue in there being more that's of value in the world than his doing any of the other things it's open to him to do at the time. Two consequentialists might differ in their views about which the things are that are of value. They might differ about the truth or falsity of certain evaluatives. One might claim that what's of value is really ultimately only good experiences. Another might claim that other things are really ultimately of value. Both agree, however, that directives about what a person ought to do are analyzable into evaluatives about the consequences of his doing it or of his doing something else. Hence the name consequentialism. Now, very few philosophers uh, these days think that consequentialism is true. 
The contemporary literature of ethics is crammed with arguments against it. The arguments against it have by now come themselves to be even more dismaying than the uh, hitherto arguments uh, uh, for it. Uh, I think that most of those arguments are right on target, and I'm not going to stop to survey them. What I want to do instead is, with considerable nervousness, to offer you an alternative theory or anyway, the beginnings of an alternative theory, for that's all I've got. It is, like consequentialism, a theory according to which the directives are analyzable into evaluatives, but the evaluatives into which it analyzes the directives are different from those that consequentialists fix attention on. Section Roman 2 on the handout. Uh, I want to begin with three remarks about the directives because I think it pays us uh, to uh, have them before us explicitly. First, this is Little Roman 2, Little Roman 1. First, some directives are moral judgments and some are not. If I say the words, Jones ought to be kind to his little brother, then I'm presumably making a moral judgment. If I whisper to you while Smith is playing chess, Smith ought to move his rook, I'm presumably not making a moral judgment. What marks a judgment made by the use of the word ought as a moral judgment, if it is, is not the fact that the judger used the word ought in making it. For there's nothing peculiarly moral lurking in the meaning of that word. What marks a judgment made by the use of the word ought as a moral judgment is rather the grounds on which the judger makes the judgment. The most common ground for saying the words Smith ought to move his rook is that Smith's moving his rook would be a good chess move. And if I say those words on that common, most common ground, then the judgment I make is not a moral one. But the judgment I make might instead be a, a moral judgment. If I say the words, Smith ought to move his rook on the ground that Smith won the last game all too easily, and his opponent is a child who's becoming increasingly miserable, <laughs> and that kindness in Smith would call for his giving the child a bit of a chance, and Smith's moving his rook would give the child that bit of a chance, then the judgment I make that he ought to move his rook is a moral judgment. Same words used, non-moral judgment in one case, moral judgment in the other. Little Roman II, there's a second point about directives. I said a moment ago that there's nothing peculiarly moral lurking in the meaning of the word ought, and I therefore have to back off a bit because the word is ambiguous. But it takes, it pays to take note of what marks it as ambiguous. 
In particular, I don't suggest that the word ought is ambiguous in having a chess meaning, which is the one I express when I say Smith ought to move his rook on the most common ground for saying so, and a moral meaning, which is the one I express when I say Smith ought to move his rook on the ground that kindness calls for him to do so, as also yet another meaning, a medical meaning, which is the one your doctor expresses when he says you ought to get more exercise, and what we might call the Wall Street meaning, which is the one your investment advisor expresses when he says you ought to diversify your portfolio. If the word ought had a chess meaning and a moral meaning, then there'd be no room for a person to ask a question that I take it to be perfectly clear that he can ask. What I have in mind is this. Suppose we tell Smith, look, moving your rook would be a good chess move. On the other hand, if you move your rook, then that's going to cause the death, deaths of thousands of people. We can imagine that learning these things leaves Smith puzzled, since he's a bit slow. So he asks us, which he ought to do, move his rook or not move his rook. If the word ought were ambiguous as between a chess meaning and a moral meaning, among others, then there'd be no such question. There would be a question which he ought to do in the chess sense of the word ought, and another question which he ought to do in the moral sense of the word ought, but no question which he simply ought to do. That can't be right. There not only is such a question, there's a perfectly clear answer to it, namely that he ought not move his rook. Nevertheless, the word ought really is uh, two ways ambiguous. I think it's at most two ways. Uh, at all events, uh, it's two ways ambiguous. Consider this sentence, Jones ought to pass by us soon. Typically, I suppose, that's said on moral grounds. Perhaps that Jones has promised to pass by us soon. But suppose that we're looking out of a window on the fifth floor of the Empire State Building. We know that Jones has decided to throw himself off the roof at 4 p.m. And it's 4 p.m. now. When I say to you that Jones ought to pass by us soon, that was laughter of Jones, I mean something that's not made false if there's no moral ground for him to pass by us soon. So let's distinguish between what I'll call the epistemic and the normative senses of the word ought. Jones ought to pass by us soon, that sentence, 
epistemically understood means that Jones is likely to pass by us soon. Jones ought to pass by us soon, that sentence, normatively understood, means that Jones is, roughly speaking, called on, supposed to pass by us soon. I think it a plausible idea that ought, in the epistemic sense, is ultimately analyzable into ought in the normative sense, roughly having to do with what uh, normatively ought to weigh, what reasons ought to weigh heavily one way or another. Very, very, it's a very rough idea. Uh, but I'm going to bypass the question how that might, uh, uh, how that reduction of the epistemic to the normative might go. What matters for us is that the class of judgments I'm calling directives includes judgments made by use of the word ought in the normative sense and does not include judgments made by use of the word ought in the epistemic sense. And from here on, unless I say otherwise, I'm throughout going to mean ought normatively. The third remark, this is little Roman three. The third remark that needs making about the directives is that they include judgments that are not about people. Toasters are manufactured to toast toastables. Bread, bagels, frozen waffles, and the like. I'll just say bread for short. So your toaster ought to toast bread. Imagine you buy a new toaster and with it comes this little card, your new General Electric toaster ought to provide you with many years of safe, even toasting. I don't mean, when I say that your toaster ought to toast bread, I don't mean that it's likely to toast bread. That may very well be true. I mean something else, rather that it's called on, supposed to, indeed, that it ought to do so. My judgment about it is normative, not epistemic. Again, people who say the sun ought to come out soon are typically using ought epistemically. What they mean is that the sun is likely to come out soon. It takes someone with very weird cosmological views to say those words meaning them normatively possible. Indeed, the sentence is ambiguous. If someone says the sun ought to come out soon, meaning that the sun is likely to come out soon, and someone else whose cosmological views are weird says the sun ought not come out soon, meaning that the sun is called on to stay hidden, then there's no further question which the sun ought to do, come out or not come out. There's a question whether the sun ought epistemically to come out soon, 
and another question whether it ought normatively to come out soon but no further question which it simply ought to do. And this third remark about directives is of particular importance. Uh, I suggest that it's precisely by virtue of what we learn when we attend to directives that are about non-human things that we can best understand all the directives and thus those that are about people as well. I also want to uh, say that I've stressed this difference between the epistemic and the normative uh, senses of ought because I, I, I want to be clear that when I say the toaster ought to toast bread, I'm not predicting, merely predicting. <laughs> uh, so what should we say then about the directives? Uh, section <coughs> capital Roman three. I suggest first that the directives are kind dependent. Indeed, a directive is true of a thing only if the thing is a member of a kind that I'm going to call a normative kind and indeed more strongly, a thing, call it capital A, ought to do a thing, ought to be, that's some verb or verb phrase, ought to do a thing, only if there's a normative kind such that A is a member of the normative kind and such that if A doesn't do the thing, then A is a defective K, a defective member of the kind. I've called that suggestion the necessary condition on your handout. Uh, I should add uh, what, what's a normative kind uh, I'll say that K, a kind K, is a normative kind just in case there is such a property as being a defective K. The kind toaster, for example, is a normative kind. Since there is such a property as being a defective toaster, as I said, toasters are manufactured to toast bread. And if a toaster comes off the assembly line and won't toast bread, then it's a defective toaster. By contrast, the kind pebble is not a normative kind. There's no such property as being a defective pebble. What would that come to? Similarly, the kinds puddle and piece of blue paper are not normative kinds. There are no such properties as being a defective puddle or being a defective piece of blue paper. Let's return to toasters. Consider the directive judgment, Arabic, one, A ought to toast bread. <coughs> Suppose that A is a toaster. Then there is a normative kind K, namely the kind toaster, such that A is a member of K, and such that if A doesn't toast bread, 
then it's a defective member of the kind. It's a defective toaster. That being the case, the judgment one meets what I called the necessary condition. Not out on the handout. What if A is a lawnmower? Then I doubt that A is a member of any normative kind, such that if A doesn't toast bread, then it's a defective member of that kind. You don't get to be a defective lawnmower by failing to toast bread. If that's right, then given that A is a lawnmower, one doesn't meet the necessary condition. But that's as it should be. It truly isn't true of any lawnmower that it ought to toast bread. To forestall an objection, I should perhaps stress that the words I wrote in writing Arabic 1 have to be understood as an abbreviation. I say that a toaster is a defective toaster if it doesn't toast bread, but not in just any circumstances. A toaster is marked as defective when it fails to toast bread only if it's been plugged in, the bread was inserted in the slots, the bar was depressed, and you aren't sitting in the bathtub while doing all of that. A toaster is marked as defective when it fails to toast bread only if it fails to toast bread in suitable circumstances. So what a toaster ought to do is only to toast bread in those suitable circumstances. I'm not going to try to spell out what all those circumstances, suitable circumstances are. I'll just abbreviate by saying that a toaster ought to toast bread. And I'm going to help myself to similar abbreviations in what follows. Here's another example. The kind seeing eye dog is a normative kind. Seeing eye dogs aren't manufactured to do things, but they're trained to do things. In particular, they're trained to stop their masters at street corners. Then if a seeing eye dog doesn't do that, it's a defective seeing eye dog. So suppose that A is a seeing eye dog. Then the directive judgment, Arabic 2, A ought to stop its master at street corners, meets the necessary condition. That's because Given that A is a seeing eye dog, there's a normative kind, namely the kind seeing eye dog, such that A is a member of the kind, and such that if A doesn't stop its master at street corners, then A is a defective member of the kind. The kind's toaster and seeing eye dog share an interesting further feature beyond their both being normative kinds. They're what I'll call function kinds. That is, there's a function associated with each of those kinds such that its members failing to carry out that function or carrying it out badly that marks it as a defective member of the kind. Toasters are manufactured to toast bread. That means they have the function of toasting bread. And a toaster's failing to do that marks it as a defective toaster. Seeing eye dogs are trained to serve as eyes for the blind. That means they have the function of serving as eyes for the blind. 
And as seeing eye dogs failing to do that, marks it as a defective seeing eye dog. And I think we can see that every function kind is also a normative kind. Here's a third function kind, the kind pancreatic gland. The pancreas isn't either manufactured or trained to do things, but among its functions is to secrete digestive enzymes. It's an interesting disputed issue in the philosophy of biology, just what it is that gives the pancreas and other human organs the functions that they do have. That is, whether it's evolution or the role those body parts currently play in the bodily economy. I'm going to leave aside the question uh, what it is that explains uh, why the pancreas has the function that it does. Whatever explains why it has that function, namely secreting digestive enzymes, it nevertheless does have that function. And if yours doesn't do that, then it's a defective pan uh, pancreas. So if A is your pancreas, then the judgment three, A ought to secrete digestive enzymes, meets the necessary condition. <laughs> Uh, we should notice that the normative kinds are not limited to the function kinds. Beefsteak tomatoes are bred to be big and fat at maturity. And if a particular beefsteak tomato turns out to be little at maturity, perhaps because of some freak in the weather, then it's a defective beefsteak tomato. But being big and fat at maturity isn't a function of a beefsteak tomato. It's just a feature such that if a beefsteak tomato lacks it, then it's a defective one. In any case, though the kind Beef steak tomato isn't a function kind, it is a normative kind. And we can say that if A is a beef steak tomato, then the judgment for A ought to be a big fat tomato at maturity meets the necessary condition. I hope those examples make the necessary condition seem plausible. Section four. That takes us only part way. For what we need is a condition that's sufficient as well as necessary. Well, what, might we simply suppose that what I call the necessary condition is also a sufficient condition? I called the following thesis the first candidate necessary and sufficient condition on your handout. It says that A ought to do a thing if and only if there is a normative kind K such that A is a member of K and such that if A doesn't do the thing then A is a defective K. Well, it's over strong. There is such a kind as the kind jewel thief. It's a function kind, since the function of a jewel thief is to steal good jewelry. And a jewel thief who can't tell good jewelry from junk and who therefore steals the junk instead of the good jewelry, 
is a defective jewel thief. It follows that the kind jewel thief is a normative kind. Then let A be a jewel thief. It follows that A is a member of a normative kind, such that if A doesn't steal good jewelry, then he's a defective member of the kind. If the first candidate necessary and sufficient condition is true, then so is judgment five. A ought to steal good jewelry. Well, we can't have a theory that yields that outcome. So what to do? Well, what exactly makes five false? It might strike us to think that what makes it false is that people ought not steal anything. And a fortiori, they ought not steal good jewelry. Since jewel thieves are people, A is not only a jewel thief, but a person. And that's why A ought not steal good jewelry. We can accommodate that intuition if we opt for the following more complex necessary and sufficient condition. I called it the second candidate necessary and sufficient condition. It looks more complicated than it is. It's actually a rather simple thesis. Let's walk through it and I'll give an example. A ought to do a thing if and only if there's a normative kind K such that A is a member of K and such that alpha, if A doesn't do the thing, then A is a defective K. And beta, there's no normative kind K plus such that K is a subkind of K plus and such that A is a defective K plus if he does do the thing. I think you can see that this is muddled on the case of the jewel thief, which let's look at. Consider again five, where A is a jewel thief. We really want that to turn out to be false. Five should be false. How do we get it to be false? The kind jewel thief is a normative kind. So there's a normative kind K such that A is a member of K and such that Alpha, if A doesn't steal good jewelry, then A is a defective member of the kind. That kind is the kind jewel thief. So clause alpha is true. What about clause beta? The kind jewel thief is a subkind of the kind person. And it's intuitively plausible to think that the kind person is a normative kind. But A is surely a defective person if he does steal good jewelry. So clause beta is false. And if that's right, then the second candidate necessary and sufficient condition explains, yields that five is false. By contrast, Consider again, one, uh, A ought to toast bread. If A is a toaster, the kind toaster is a normative kind. So there's a normative kind such that A is a member of it, an alpha. If A doesn't toast bread, then A is a defective member of the kind. 
so clause alpha is true. What about clause beta? It's very plausible to think that there's no normative kind, K plus, that the kind toaster is a subkind of, such that if A does toast bread, then it's a defective K plus. If that's right, then that would explain why one is true. Now, I confess that I really like that second candidate, necessary and sufficient condition. What it expresses is what I think is a deep and important idea about the concept ought. Namely, that what lies at its heart is the concept defect. Thus, that what something or someone ought to do is fixed by and turns ultimately on what the thing or person would be marked as defective for doing or not doing. Let's contrast this idea with consequentialism. According to the consequentialist, what fixes whether a person ought to do a thing is the consequences of his doing it and the consequences of his doing anything else that he could have done instead or could do instead at that time. Among the many serious arguments against consequentialism <coughs> is that it holds the acceptability of a person's doing a thing hostage to what will or will not happen if he does it down through the years for as long as the person's act goes on having consequences. That's most implausible when you think about whether you ought to brush your teeth uh, in, in the morning, uh, the idea that the whole of future history bears on uh, it. Now, the alternative expressed by that second candidate necessary and sufficient condition certainly allows that the consequences of a person's doing or not doing a thing bear on whether he ought to do it, but only insofar as his act having those consequences would show him to be a defective person if he did or didn't do it. Um, that strikes me as, as it should be. At the same time, the alternative yields that directives are analyzable into evaluatives for ascriptions of defectiveness are certainly ascriptions of disvalue. They're strong. Uh, uh, negative evaluatives. Okay, now having it lavishly praised my own proposal, and there was more praise that I cut because we're running short of time, uh, having lavishly praised it, I have to grant that there's trouble uh, ahead for it. Um, I don't know whether I should take time to mention both. Uh, I, I thought I would mention two of the serious difficulties for it, but at any rate, I, it's important for us to uh, have a look at the first of them. I'm sure others of you will have other objections, which uh, we will hear in the discussion uh, period. In any case, the first trouble is one that emerges with people. Is the kind person really a normative kind? Is there really such a property as being a defective person? I'll bring out the source of my doubt about that shortly. Uh, notice that if it isn't, 
then my tidy little way of dealing with that jewel thief isn't going to succeed. Uh, now, I'll bring out the, the source of my doubt about whether, about the, the, the idea that there's such a thing in property as being an effective person. Uh, what we should look at first is an argument to the effect that it is a normative kind. It's an argument that comes from, or I attribute it to, and he is nervous about making attributions to, uh, uh, to Aristotle when they were experts uh, within hearing. Uh, so I'll just say we would not be entirely um, uh, guilty. Uh, there's some excuse for. Uh, and in fact, it's an argument that we can attribute to Aristotle uh, that uh, is, was my reason for introducing the notion of a function kind in the first place. Uh, let's look at the uh, argument. Aristotle said that the flute player and the sculptor have functions to play the flute and to sculpt of course. So also do the carpenter and the tanner have functions. Then Aristotle asked rhetorically, have they functions and man none? And he answered his own question, yes, man also has a function. Aristotle said, the function of man is to lead a certain kind of life and this is an activity or actions of the soul implying a rational principle. Very roughly, the function of a person is to think and act in accord with reason. If that's right, then the kind person is a function kind, like the kinds flute player, sculptor, carpenter, and tanner, and like the kinds toaster, seeing eye dog, and pancreas. It follows then that if, uh, uh, if a person doesn't perform that function, then he's a defective person, just as if a toaster doesn't toast bread. It's a defective toaster. And it follows that there is such a property as being a defective person, and therefore that the kind person is a normative kind. Can Aristotle be right? Uh, uh, he's surely right that people do think and act in accord with reason, or anyway, they often do, and when they do, they do so more or less well. Is that the function of a person? Aristotle said that the flute player, the sculptor, the carpenter, and the tanner have functions. And he asked rhetorically, have they functions and man none? He thought it would be peculiar that they should have functions and man have no function. Let's drop down a level to dogs. I now mimic Aristotle. The seeing eye dog, the retriever, and the guard dog have functions. Have they functions and dog none? What could be thought to be the function of a dog? A function every dog has, whether or not it's a seeing eye dog or a retriever or a guard dog or none of the above. Being a dog is just being a member of the genus Canis. There are many features that dogs have in common, among them the features that mark them as members of the genus. But none of them is the function of a dog. At least none of them is the function of a dog. If we understand that notion function in a way intuitively guided by the examples uh, before us of flute playing and sculpting. So far as I can see, 
the same holds of people. Being a human being is being a member of the species Homo sapiens. There are many features that people have in common, and presumably the one Aristotle pointed to is one that they do have in common. But it's not plausibly thought to be the function of a person. I'm going to cut. Six uh, says, well, perhaps section Roman six says, well, perhaps uh, people then are more like beefsteak tomatoes. Uh, and and uh, I think we want to just take a, a look at beefsteak tomatoes. I said that they're bred to be big and fat at maturity, and if a particular one turns out to be little at maturity, then it's a defective beefsteak tomato. That's not, being big and fat is not the function of a beefsteak tomato, but it is normal for a tomato, a beefsteak tomato. These are physical features, and lacking them marks one as physically defective. Dogs lead richer lives than tomatoes. They can be physically defective. They're normally four-legged, and a dog born with only three legs because of some pre-birth accident is a physically defective dog. It is normal in a dog to be four-legged in a sense of normal that issues from its root the notion norm. Uh, a three-legged dog fails to meet the physical norms for dogs. A dog can also fail to meet the intellectual norms for dogs. Dogs are more or less teachable, and if you've got one that isn't, uh, you have not only a problem how to, how to deal with the dog, you have a dog that fails to meet the intellectual norms for the species. People can be defective in a third way, namely morally defective. And now, what do we do about the notion being a defective person? If we take it that being a defective person, this has the ring of a moral sound to it, if we take it that being a defective person is being a morally defective person and apply now our necessary and sufficient condition, we're going to be in trouble with a certain kind of sentence, judgment that I think we ought to accommodate. I call this uh, six. Suppose A believes that all men are mortal and that Socrates is a man. I think we had better allow that it's true that A ought to believe that Socrates is mortal. If we're to allow that, and bring to bear the kind of uh, uh, criterion that I've offered, then we have to reject the idea that defectiveness is moral defectiveness. We have to allow, as a possibility, intellectual defectiveness, physical defectiveness, defectiveness in any of the ways that a person can be defective. And now how to accommodate that? I've uh, offered two uh, alternatives, two options for dealing with it. 
uh, and uh, I, just, what I say in the in the paper is, I spare you the details uh, because uh, accommodating the the fact that uh, people can differ in these ways, uh, with a reluctance to say that a person born blind is a defective person, though. We may be ready to say he's a physically defective person. Saying that he's a defective person is another matter. Uh, so in order to accommodate this, uh, um, a considerable amount of fussing with my nice, simple, uh, proposed thesis uh, gets called for. Now I'm going to skip the second trouble. So I will not be letting you in on a further difficulty. Uh, and it can go right to uh, the conclusion. Um, let me just remind you then of where uh, uh, we've come. Maybe you ought to telephone your mother tonight. I asked what would it come to for that to be the case. I suggested that the word ought has only one normative meaning. And that for an understanding of what it comes to, for it to be true that a person ought to do a thing, we should stop staring at moral judgments. We should look further afield. We should look at non-moral directives about people, such, that, such as that a person who believes that all men are mortal and Socrates is a man ought to believe that Socrates is mortal. And particularly important, we should look at directives that are about things that are not people. I suggested that when we do, what we see is that, as I put it, the concept defect is at the heart of the concept ought. For it to be true that you ought to telephone your mother tonight is for it to be the case that it would be, in a way, defective in you to not do so, like a toaster that won't toast bread. In short, normativity reaches all the way down and all the way up. All of us are normatively governed in the same way. And I mean to include not just us people, but also us seeing eye dogs and beefsteak tomatoes. The defects we may exemplify certainly differ, but the bearing of these defects on our conduct is the same. So that's the proposal. And I'm sorry I ran on so long. Mm -hmm.